Brother Ethan Duncan is going to lead us in a word of prayer. After that, uh, we'll begin our class this morning. Give everybody a chance to sit down. If you bow with me, please. Thank you, Lord, for this yet another wonderful Sunday morning that you've allowed us to gather together and learn more about your word and congregate together and enjoy each other's company and grow as Christians. May we take this class period lesson to heart and may we apply it to our lives, Lord, and may it benefit and enrich us. In Jesus Christ's most holy name, amen. I am really thrilled with the fact that we are getting more back to normal. Uh, I am a people person, and I'd love to be mingling among all the members, but it's rather difficult to do so when uh, just as soon as I meet somebody, the first thing I want to do is stick out my hand and shake hands, and I'm not supposed to do that. So that's the reason why after uh, the worship service, I stay up here at the front, and uh, I'm sort of trying to avoid getting in among everyone because I really want to you know, get together, talk, visit, and I'm looking forward to soon when we'll be able to have that kind of close uh, upbuilding, encouraging uh, meeting together with one another. We're in our study of the Bible overview, and we have already covered the Old Testament, and last week we covered what was called the intertestamental period between the close of the Old Testament and the opening of the New Testament. And if you'll remember, as we discussed that in our last class, that involved a number of things, understanding that there were things that arose during the period of that intertestamental period, the things such as uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and uh, other things such as that. But today we're going to begin our discussion of the Gospels accounts. And uh, I'll point out to you again that the Bible is to be viewed as a library, not just as one book, but as a collection of books. And you have the Old Testament and the New Testament, 39 books in the Old, 27 in the New. And when you think of the Old Testament, you think of law, history, poetry, and prophecy. And uh, we're going to begin with the first section of the New Testament, which is called the Gospel. Not Gospels, but Gospel. There are Gospel accounts, four of them, and we're going to look at them. Now I want to begin by pointing out to you that if you look at all of this, and I will go ahead and acknowledge uh, the first few slides we'll be using were prepared by Brother Dwayne Falks. Uh, uh, I got them from Brother Kirk Brothers. He, uh, these are well prepared, very uh, graphically uh, beautiful. But I want to point out to you that if you think of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each of them are telling us about the life of Jesus, the life of Christ, to tell us about who he was and what he did while he walked on the earth. And if you think about the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each of them cover the same basic information. You have the life of Christ, the apostles, the miracles, the teachings, the conflicts, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And in many ways, they follow a basic chronology, even though they're not exactly identical. And if you think about these books, you recognize if you're reading them that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are a little bit different than John. And when you look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're often called the synoptic gospels. And that's not a bad word. But I don't know there's a lot of people who want to know what the word synoptic means. If you look at the first part of it, you have sin or the S-Y-N, and that means to look at something alike or same. Um, for instance, we talk about synonyms. Those are words that are similar to one another, words that are alike. But then you have the latter part of the word optic, which means to see. So when you say synoptic, you're talking about seeing these books together or seeing them alike. And uh, so you look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke and say, how are they alike and in what areas are they different and perhaps even why are they different? Now, when I was in high school and college, we used what was called Venn diagrams. I don't know how many of you remember those, but 
you, you draw a circle and then you have an overlapping circle and there's areas where the two cover the same material. So Matthew and Mark have some similarities between the two of them. You can then draw a third circle of Luke and there's areas where Luke and Mark and Matthew all cover the same material. There's some that are common to Mark and Luke, some that are common to Luke and Matthew, and you, you see the distinction there. And then John is a little bit different, but he covers most of or much of the same amount of material. Now, there are people who study this intently. And uh, this chart in front of you represents the picture of how much is common. If you'll notice, the purple shading represents in Mark at the top. You have Luke at the bottom left and Matthew at the bottom right. And you'll see how much of each of those books is identical to the other. And then you'll have some that are alike, like, for instance, part of Mark and part of Luke may be the same. Part of Mark and part of Matthew may be the same. And so you have all of those, and you recognize that there's some uniqueness to them. And someone says, well, then why would you have four different accounts? Why wouldn't God just have one person to give the account of the gospel? And the reason is these are basically letters or reports given by the inspiration of God to various groups of people. For instance, Matthew was written to a Jewish audience. That's the reason why he pictures Jesus as the king. He goes back and he traces the Davidic line to point out that Jesus was the son of David. Then you have Mark who was writing to the Romans who emphasized Jesus was the servant and uh, he served men. Luke, writing to Theophilus, who was Greek, by the way, that's a Greek name, he was writing to him about Jesus as the man, emphasizing his humanity. And then John was writing to everyone. And he was writing about Jesus being the Son of God, emphasizing his divinity. Or if you look at their occupations, you have Matthew, who was a tax collector. Uh, he was a man who worked for the Roman government, who received taxes from the Jewish citizens and then forwarded that money on to Rome. He emphasized the Jesus of prophecy. He would go back and he would look at those passages, for instance, perhaps in the book of Psalms or in Isaiah, and would say, this is the fulfillment of those passages. Mark was a missionary. Perhaps we should call him John Mark because that's who he was. He traveled with, first of all, Paul and Barnabas. Then he traveled with Barnabas. And then ultimately it appears that he was uh, being uh, a missionary even by himself. And he emphasized Jesus' action. That's an important term to the Romans. They want to see somebody who's doing something. And there's so much activity in the account given by Mark. Luke was a physician, a doctor, if you will. And because of that, he emphasized Jesus' humanity of his nature, uh, the fact that he, for instance, was grieved in his spirit. Or he did very, he observed various things about Jesus' physical life. And then John was a fisherman, and he looked at Jesus' divinity, how the fact that he possessed all the characteristics that were of God. Now, if you're thinking about our timeline, and we've been trying to do that. Their timeline goes from left to right. The one in front of you goes from AD 40 to AD 90. And if you'll notice at the top, you have the synoptic gospels, Mark, Matthew, and Luke from about AD 55 to AD 65. That would represent a time in which the church was maturing and there was a need to provide an inspired description, details of the life of Christ. You have people now who are being converted and they need a well-reasoned, well-presented picture of Jesus as the Lord, as the promised one, as the Messiah. John comes along much later, around AD 85 to 95, and he's going to present the gospel account of Jesus being the Son of God. So let's spend a few minutes now looking at each of these four books See if we can see some unique 
features and characteristics of them. The author of the book of Matthew, or Matthew's account, is Matthew, one of the apostles. He's also called Levi, which has been a Jewish name, and he was the son of Alphaeus. That means that most likely James would have been his brother. In Mark 2, verse 14, as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. Chapter 3, verse 18, he's given the names of the apostles, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, and Simon the Canaanite. So that would indicate that you have uh, Matthew and James most likely being brothers since they was a son of Alphaeus. What is he attempting to present is an account of the life of Christ. Where most likely to Judah? Because he's writing to Jews somewhere around AD 60. It's difficult to, we know it's before the destruction of the temple, but uh, most likely after the church is well developed to show that Jesus is the son of David, the Messiah, the one who fulfilled Old Testament prophecy. Now, if you're looking at Matthew's account, the outline I've tried to follow is one that I, others have presented, but uh, the first four chapters is the presentation of the king. You have him being born, you trace his lineage in the genealogies, you have his being born in Bethlehem, and you see a, a picture of the coming of Christ, his, his childhood. Then in chapters 5 through 7, the proclamation of the king, we call it the Sermon on the Mount, but he presents to us the gospel message that he's bringing, the power of the king, the miracles he performed in chapters 8 through 11, and then chapters 12 through 16, the progressive rejection of the king. Here comes Jesus, he's preaching the gospel, but people don't like it, and so they start rejecting him. Chapter 17 through 20, the preparation of the disciples. Jesus is preparing these men to do the work he's going to give them to do. And in chapters 21 through 27, the presentation of and the rejection of the king. Jesus comes into Jerusalem on the uh, riding on a donkey on that uh, Sunday before he was crucified on Friday. And you have the presentation of him but then you have the rejection and ultimately his crucifixion. And in chapter 28, the proof of the king, the fact that he was risen from the dead. Now, some key verses. Um, I will find myself struggling to present this in a short way on an overview and not choose a lot of verses, but let me just use these to begin with. Chapter 7 and verse 12, we often call the golden rule. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law of the prophets. You treat people like you would want to be treated. Or as we put it as a paraphrase, do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. You can't skip chapter 16 and verse 18. He said in, to Peter, he says, On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The Lord says he was going to build his church. At that point, it was still in the future. However, later on, after Acts 2, it will be spoken of as something that is already in existence. We come to chapter 22. And I think it's important to use this part of Matthew to see him as the one presenting Jesus as the son of David. And it says, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how then does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor was from that day anyone able to dare question him anymore. You see, Jesus was able to express to them the importance of seeing himself as the son of David and how he would have even been greater than David. And then the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So you have the presentation of Matthew and his account of the gospel of Christ. Second book you come to is the book Mark. And he is John Mark, who is the cousin of Barnabas. If you'll notice in Acts chapter 12, verse 25, Luke is describing what is taking place, and he's talking about that first missionary journey. And it says, And Barnabas and Saul returned to Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. And they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Now, John Mark was an important young man. There's a lot about him that you could study if you're wanting to look at his life personally. But Colossians chapter 4 verse 10 says, Aristarchus my prisoner greets you, or my fellow prisoner greets you, with Mark the cousin of Barnabas. The original word there that's translated cousin literally means my uh, uncle or aunt's son and uh, since it's feminine, would most likely be my aunt's son. Uh, the King James translated sister's son, but it, it's actually aunt. And it says he is related to Barnabas. And so Barnabas is here uh, evidently a mentor to John Mark. But John Mark would have been with Paul and Barnabas while they were preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and himself known it well. He presents an account of the life of Christ and most likely in Rome because this is written to the Romans probably around A.D. 50 and most of the scholars believe that Mark was likely the first of the gospel accounts written. But his emphasis was to demonstrate that Jesus was the suffering Son of Man who came to serve and not be served. You know, the Roman mind sometimes had the view of being a servant to others. And uh, for that reason, Mark concentrates on that. And if you look at an outline of it, you have, first of all, the presentation of the servant. You know, like Matthew's account, you have the beginning of his life. Second of all, you have the opposition to the servant, chapters 3 through 8. How people begin to say, we don't know if we want to follow this uh, one called Jesus. Then in chapters 9 and 10, you have the instruction by the servant, that is by Jesus, uh, his teaching. In chapters 11 through 15, you have the rejection. And it's interesting as you're studying Matthew and Mark's account and you're seeing the parallels between them, you'll see how there's a little bit of different emphasis in one area versus another, but you both end up with the rejection of him and then finally, the resurrection of the servant. The emphasis on the fact that Jesus came back from the, the dead. And whether you're studying Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, that's one of the essential elements of the gospel. That Jesus was not just a man, but he was actually God in the flesh. And Mark has some very valuable portions of Scripture. And I know it's just three sections, but I think these are some key principles from it. Mark chapter 10, verses 43 through 45. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Mark is trying to persuade people to, to view Jesus as he really was, as a suffering servant and as an example for those of us who are going to follow him as well. And then in chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, Mark's account of the Great Commission. He said to him, to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved or will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. It's interesting that when you compare what Matthew said with what Mark said, both of them emphasize that the Great Commission involves baptizing. Something that the world so often ignores, 
They both include that. Now, interesting, immediately following this, Mark says, these signs shall follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. If they take up serpents, if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, uh, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere. The Lord was working with them, confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Now there's some importance to this because after giving the Great Commission, he's talking about how these people would take that message and go into all the world. And how that God would use the miraculous to confirm his word. See, after the word was circulated and confirmed, there was no need to continue to confirm it. But the guy in Woods used an example years ago of a scaffold. And he said, if you're building a building, he said, you put a scaffold around it so you can work on it. But once you finish, you take the scaffolding down because it's not needed anymore. The same thing is true about these miraculous gifts. After the gospel was once fully presented, confirmed there was no need for these miraculous gifts to continue. And By the way, if you're studying Acts with us again next week, you will notice that there is uh, a connection between the miraculous gifts and the laying on of the apostles' hands. The third of these books is Luke. And if you go to Colossians chapter 4 and verse 14, we read, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. To say Luke is a physician indicates he was a healer. But Luke, it appears, not only was a healer, but he was very interested in the souls of men. He traveled with Paul, and he traveled throughout the area. If you're reading the book of Acts, you'll notice the we passages that will talk about that. But he is presenting an account of the life of Christ to a man by the name of Theophilus. And he's talking about those things which are most surely believed among us. He said, I want to write to you an orderly account. And so as you and I are reading the book of Luke, we recognize that that's what it is. And it's very possible that he wrote it from Caesarea, writing to this Greek audience, probably somewhere around AD 60 to 62. He wanted to portray Jesus as the Savior of the world to emphasize his humanity. And 25 times in the book of Luke, he's called the Son of Man. And I will mention to you that the terms Son of in the Bible generally indicates attributes of. To say he was a Son of God indicates that he had the attributes of God. To say that he was a Son of Man indicates that he had the attributes of man. Luke was drawing attention to the humanity of Jesus. You know, there's a problem sometimes with people who didn't see Jesus as a real person. John, we'll notice in a few minutes, will talk about that he was come in the flesh. The book of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John talks about Jesus coming in the flesh. To emphasize he was a real man, not just a figure, not just some sort of a metaphor, but he was a real person who walked this earth, who was experienced hunger and thirst and all these things. Well, Luke is drawing attention to his humanity. An outline, you have the introduction to the Son of Man, chapters 1 through 4. He does much like Matthew does in presenting to us, here's the early life of Jesus. Then he talks about the ministry of the Son of Man in chapters 5 through 9. And then rejection of the Son of Man in chapters 10 through 19. And again, much like Matthew and Mark's account, you have after Jesus preaching that period of life in which men have decided they didn't want to follow him and their rejection of him. And that led up to the crucifixion and resurrection of the Son of Man in chapters 20 through 24. Now for just a few minutes, let's look at some of the verses which I believe have some great impact of describing the life of Luke. In chapter 1, 1 through 4, Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, 
just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had a perfect understanding of all those things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know with certainty the things in which you were instructed. Here's the value of that. Here's a man who's going to get a written message of things that he had been told verbally. I can see the great value of the book of Luke because here's the order of things and you can know with certainty that what you've been told was correct and accurate. How do you know that? Because Luke knew the eyewitnesses. Luke was inspired in the sense that he could deliver a message guaranteed by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter chapter 1, 20 and 21. You get to chapter 17, verse 10. So likewise, when you have done all those things which you were commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. Luke wants to emphasize the fact that you and I should be appreciative of what's been done for us, that we do not merit what we get. We're just simply, if we're doing what we're told, is doing what we're told. In chapter 19, verse 10, with regards to Zacchaeus, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And Then chapter 24, the great commission presented by Luke. Then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all the things must be Fulfill which were written in the law of Moses, and the prophets, and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are the witnesses of these things, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, until you're in due from power from on high. And notice with me, if you will, verse 37, that repentance and remission of sins. Luke will later record in Acts 2, verse 38, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Luke was tying the importance of repenting with remission of sins. Mark emphasized the faith. Matthew emphasized the teaching. And Luke is going to emphasize the repentance. And you say, wow, I'm, I'm starting to see the reason for having all these accounts of the gospel because you're seeing a fuller picture. Now I want you to imagine if I had four people up here on the stage, we put one here, one here, one here, one over there. And then there's something happening at the back. And the people who are up here would look and see what was occurring and each would describe it to the person to whom they're talking. But one of them may notice, for instance, here's a man with a red shirt on. Another may say he was a tall man. Another man, person may observe that he was a tall man with black hair. And you say, well, are they contradicting one another? No, they're not. But they're, they're presenting for us, each from his own perspective, something that was important. And you think about Luke, and Luke's emphasizing the importance of the repentance and the remission of sins. And I will tell you, verse 48 and 49 was to the apostles, because they were going to go to Jerusalem, and when they were endued with power from on high, is when the Holy Spirit came upon them, on the day of Pentecost. Now let's take the book of John. And uh, John is the author, John the Apostle, who is the brother of James, who was his partner in the fishing business. Their father was named Zebedee. Uh, by the way, they were also partners with Peter and Andrew, who were also brothers. So now if you say, are you meaning to say that there were several brothers in the Apostles? Yes, you had James and John who were brothers. You had Peter and Andrew who were brothers. And you had Matthew or Levi and James, the son of Alphaeus, who were brothers. At least three sets of brothers. But this is John the apostle, the son of Zebedee. 
And this is an apologetic of Jesus' deity. The word apologetics does not mean that someone's saying they're sorry. The word apologetic literally means defense. And so he's given a defense of Jesus being the Son of God, probably to somewhere in Asia Minor. You know, John, it appears, goes toward Asia Minor, perhaps to Ephesus. We do know when he writes the book of Revelation, he's on the Isle of Patmos. And so that's an area of uh, what would be the eastern Mediterranean uh, in the, what's the country of Turkey today. Very late, around AD 85 or 95, John would have been an older man by then. And his purpose was to show that Jesus was God in the flesh and to create faith and trust in him. Now, if you look at the book, it's outlined a little bit differently than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You began with the incarnation of the Son of God, where you'll have, for instance, Matthew and Luke, starting with the genealogy, John said, let's just go all the way back to the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He goes not just to his birth, but to the very essence of Jesus in the very beginning. In chapters 2 through 4 is a presentation of the Son of God. He's presented to Israel. Here's who he is, and here's how you believe in him. Now, chapter 5 through 12 is the opposition to the Son of God. I think particularly about Jesus going to Jerusalem and in those feasts, like chapter 7, the Feast of Tabernacles, and how he gets there and people are scratching their head. Well, is he the Son of God or not? And some people said, well, he's a good man. Others said, no, he deceives the people. And then in chapters 13 through 17, the preparation of the disciples of the Son of God. You know, really, you look at chapters 13 through 17, it's right before Jesus is going to be betrayed in the garden. It's that Thursday night in which they have celebrated the Passover meal. That's where he'll begin with, let not your heart be troubled. And uh, through chapter 17, leads you right up until that period of time right before he is arrested when he is praying. Chapters 18 through 21 is the crucifixion and the resurrection of the Son of God. Now, here's my key verses, and then we'll bring it all to a close. Chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. There's enough here to know that there's Jesus and there's the Father. They're distinct because you have the word with, but he also possesses the same characteristics of God. You could not cover the Gospel of John without looking at chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The love that God had for this old world and those who are in it. Chapter 8 and verse 24, Jesus is confronting those who did not believe in him. And he said, therefore I said to you, you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. In reality, it's like Luke 13, verse 3 and verse 5. I tell you, no, unless you repent, you'll perish. He said, either you believe in me or you're going to die in your sins. And John's message is to say, this is the Jesus. In chapter 10, verse 10, I cited in our sermon this morning, the thief does not come except to kill, steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that they may have life and may have it more abundantly. You understand why Jesus came, the purpose of it. In chapter 12, we learn that there were people who believed in him, but they were fearful of the, the um, people of the day. Nevertheless, even of the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. I put this in here for more than one reason. Number one is to see the picture of what was going on in the first century. Here you've got rulers of the Jews, most likely the Sanhedrin. 
They believe in Jesus. You've got two you know of, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, who are among that group, who believed in him. What happens to Nicodemus? He comes to Jesus by night. There's a lot of uh, hesitancy. But he says there was many who believed in him, but they would not confess him. And the second reason for doing that is there's a lot of Christians like that today. You put them under a situation where people are antagonistic toward the truth, what will they do? They'll fold just like an old leaf. Chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If we're not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Here are some disciples about to witness the death of Christ on the cross. Within the 24-hour period of time, they're going to see Jesus arrested, they're going to see him beaten, they're going to see him nailed to a cross, and they're going to see him give up the ghost. And for them, it may appear to be a total loss. But he says, let your heart not heart be troubled, because if you believe in God, believe in me. And he's going to talk about the future, the house with many rooms in it. Chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. And Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. He said there's a lot of things that's not written in this book. There's many things that Jesus did, but he said, what we have here is written so that you can believe he's the Son of God. There's enough there. If you want to create faith in Jesus and a person, you study the account of the Gospel account of John, and you say, here's who he is. Here's the message of the cross. And guess where we're at? My voice is almost gone, <laughs> so... Uh, we're going to begin here next week. We're going to start with the book of Acts. And we're going to go as far as we can go in Paul's epistles. Then the week after that, we're going to try to finish up the New Testament. And then the 28th, we're going to have a special speaker. Uh, Brother Jeff Archie will be with us on that Sunday. And so uh, we're looking forward to that. But uh, if you do want any of these uh, slides, be sure to send me an email. I'll probably send out uh, the notes for the class today uh, sometime this afternoon or tomorrow. But if you will, bow with me. We'll have a word of prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Our Holy Father, we're so thankful for the privilege we have in having your word. We're thankful for the ability to be able to study it and learn from it. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the message that they presented to us. We're thankful we have it. We can learn more about the life of Christ. Continue to be with each of us. May, Lord, we be able to assemble together this evening at 6 o'clock to be able to worship you once again. Until then, Heavenly Father, we offer our thanks and appreciation. In Christ's name, amen.